So last night, and I'm still sick, by the way. So my voice, my voice is suffering. Forgive that. Last night I finished uh, Margaret Barker's The Kingdom of, The Hidden Tradition of the Kingdom of God. Um, this is kind of a sequel to her introduction to temple theology. And uh, the next one you might consider to be um, the, the third installment in a trilogy where she talks about temple mysticism. So those are short books, uh, relatively easy and cheap to be had. You get them under 20 bucks used. Cheaper than that, certainly, if you look. Um, and if you read, th I'm assuming, if you read all three of them, you'll have a pretty well-rounded understanding of Margaret Barker's temple theology. It's, it's interesting, and I think there's far more truth in it than there is in a standard um, view of Christian theology, of a, monothe of a monolithic um, Jewish stream, a monolithic Jewish religion, which gives birth to Christianity. That's just really not true. It's one of the reasons that Jesus and John the Baptist are both basically Jewish heretics, and they're treated as such by the authorities. And they take so much issue with the ruling class of religious elites in Jerusalem. And Jesus pronounces a judgment and a curse against the temple and says it will be torn down. It's because um, Second Temple Judaism, especially as it's an outgrowth of not just religious developments during uh, the exile, but an outgrowth of the religious turmoil of the reigns of Hezekiah and Josiah. What Jesus represents, along with the Essenes, along with John the Baptist, and along with any other quasi-Gnostic, um, unorthodox Jews of the first century, they represent a tradition that goes all the way back to the first temple, a tradition that acknowledges um, El as the high God and Father, and acknowledges at least two powers in heaven. Well, this became anathema in later Judaism, the idea that there could possibly be more than one monist God. But if you read temple literature, and particularly things like uh, Enoch, you realize that this is precisely the case, that um, those who are able to pierce the veil, so to speak, those who are able to have these grand visions of God and to be instructed directly uh, by God, from God, men like Moses, they are thought to be more than men. They're thought to be the, they become the Lord. They become Jehovah. They become an angel of the Lord, such that when Moses comes back down from the mountain, his face shines. Likewise, in Third Enoch, Enoch um, pierces the veil and enters what Paul might have called the third heaven. And Enoch becomes Metatron. He becomes an angel of the Lord. And he sits down on the throne of God. So what this shows is there's a tradition of men being elevated to the position of godhood, or at least bearing the name of God, standing in the stead of God. And that this is not an incarnation. And what Jesus experiences, according to Margaret Barker, um, in her book here, what Jesus experiences in his baptism is kind of an adoptionism. That when he's baptized, he hears from the heavens, uh, Behold, um, my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. That this is not the voice of the Father, this is the voice of a feminine spirit. And this is the voice of the wisdom of God, the mother of the Son saying in this adoption process that this Jesus is now the Christ and that Jesus pierces the veil and that much of revelation that John expresses is actually a vision that Jesus received during his earthly, um, during his, his fleshly carnal experience on this earth. Jesus experienced this heavenly vision during which he himself pierced the veil and becomes an angel of the Lord, becomes the Lord himself. That 
Jehovah is this angel of the Lord. Jesus is Jehovah. His father and God is El, which is why he cries out on the cross, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And so uh, the theology of Margaret Barker is not orthodox, but I, I despise orthodoxy. And I think that orthodoxy is constructed and very wrong. Jesus was, it seems, much like a Metatron, much like an Enoch. You could say Jesus is a, is a recurrence, is a recapitulation of Enoch in much the same way that John the Baptist is a recapitulation of Elijah. Jesus is not just a new Enoch. You could say he's the culmination of a long series of experiences, mystical experiences, had by a whole cohort of Jews who rejected the religion of their time. And so Jesus also offers a counterfaith, but also a return to the original faith of the first temple. And that's the gist of the book. That's the gist of the book, that the, the Christ experience is not really limited to Jesus, that it's really a, a tradition of the kingdom, stretching back all the way to the beginning, that within the veil is essentially the Garden of Eden, and that the tree of life is a representation of the wisdom of God. There's a triad within the, the deity, that there's God the Father, there's God the Mother, and then there's God the Son. And these are represented, um, oftentimes the, the mother aspect, the feminine aspect of God is represented by a tree or a vine. And a, the, the counter mother, so to speak, is represented as a harlot. And the grapes of wrath grow off of her vine. And she says that this is a, a long tradition of the kingdom of God stretching all the way back to the first temple. And that there are many who have pierced the veil. Every single high priest who went behind the veil was considered um, was considered to be uh, basically an angel of the Lord, a, a an embodiment of Jehovah. Likewise, every king of Israel was considered an embodiment of Jehovah. Everyone who had this mystical experience, be it Ezekiel, Isaiah, Enoch, was considered to be an embodiment of Jehovah, that they became an angel of the Lord. And likewise, Jesus is the culmination and perhaps the last one to have this experience. And he now bears the name of his God. And so inaugurates a new religion, which harkens back to the old. And so the temple, the harlot temple, uh, the, the harlot temple that, that was the second temple is destroyed. The harlot religion of unfaithful Judaism the synagogue of Satan, so to speak, is disowned and they're rejected. And instead comes the church, just like Jesus says in his parable, that many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the children of the kingdom will be cast out. That's, that's second temple Judaism and the synagogue system is said by Jesus to be disinherited. What takes his place? Jesus inaugurates the kingdom, and the church is that kingdom. Now, the church has developed into things that Jesus probably never anticipated and would never have entered his mind. But nevertheless, even it's in its corrupted form, it is that kingdom tradition. The church, and many of, many of the churches, in, in particular ones built in and around uh, the, the temple site in Jerusalem, they attempted to be architecturally, um, a copy of the, the, the temple described in Ezekiel, that is the temple of the new kingdom, the temple of the restored kingdom. And there was an understanding in early Christianity that the church was the continuation of this temple tradition, the hidden tradition of the kingdom of God. So I recommend the book. Um, it gives a new perspective on Jewish history, the, the goals of Jesus and his apostles, the goals ultimately of the church, what the church should be, it is not orthodox. Um, I think if, if Margaret Barker were to be tried for heresy, I think she'd be convicted. But I think that's also a good thing. It means that um, when she approaches scripture and she approaches tradition and the apocrypha and the pseudepigrapha, 
she's not bound and tethered by preconceived notions of, of what the gospel should be saying. Um, it's a fresh look, but also a very old look, because this is probably what Jesus' first followers were thinking and believing about the movement as it unfolded. So I recommend this book. Um, it will, it will, if you, if you're open to it, it will change your whole perspective on, on religion. And I look forward to reading the third installment, which is, um, temple mysticism, where she dives deeply into the mystical experience, which in a recent video in the comments, people have said that was basically Paul's experience. And so building on the, the revelation of Christ, we have the Pauline experience where he's caught up into the third heaven. And he has, again, what we might call a mystical experience of being uh, thrust beyond the veil. And so Paul becomes this unique disciple. And this unique apostle, uh, the apostle Paul, really becomes the foundation of Christianity as we know it today, carries it beyond what Jesus and the Twelve initiated. So I'll read that um, probably after my next surgery. Uh, but in the meantime, what I'm reading right now is uh, The Externalization of the Hierarchy by Alice Bailey. Now, I know what people are going to say. This is a New Age book. This is not worth my time. But like I said, I'm not very orthodox, so I'm open to different interpretations. What well, the externalization of the hierarchy is, is in the 1930s, post, uh, post the Great War, there was um, an, a spiritual awakening of sorts, and it took various forms and manifested, manifested itself in various ways. Um, there was an element of that mysticism. There's an element of that New Age theology that found its way into uh, Germany of the Weimar period and then heading into the Third Reich period. And however much that was discredited, uh, the UN that was formed after the Second World War took up Alice Bailey's books as kind of, um, kind of the, uh, the official theology of the UN. Uh, very close ties to the UN. So I view the book as something of possessing an inside track on what the elites want to do with the world in a century uh, post-World War II. And so one of the, uni one of the unique dates that uh, is purportedly in this book, which I haven't arrived at yet, one of the unique dates is the date, or the year rather, of 2025. Uh, 2025 being a date that Alice Bailey said that um, the hierarchy – this is a hierarchy of spiritual leadership, hidden spiritual leadership, would reconvene basically to establish a new set of goals and a new direction for the world. So the premise of this book is that there is a hierarchy of spiritual beings, um, often said to be seven in number, Jesus being one of them, that uh, inhabit the celestial plane, the spiritual world. And so inhabiting the spiritual world, they have to work through carnal means, that is, they, they, they mediate through persons because they cannot act on the world directly. But these, these seven of this brotherhood uh, have remained secret and work uh, clandestinely in the world. They convene every hundred years or so. She said the next year that they would convene, she says this in the 1930s, she says the next year that they would convene would be in uh, 2025. So, obviously, we're coming up on 2025. And not only are we coming up on 2025, but, uh, you know, the condition of the world is deteriorating rapidly. And she said that this, this would be basically the century of the externalization of the hierarchy. They would make themselves plainly known in and around the time that we're living in now. So, it's a pertinent book. If there is anything to it, I would like to know before 2025, um, a lot of her intuitions have proven uh, correct through the years. And so I'm willing to read this book with an open mind, believing that she probably knew something that 
uh, that I don't know and that we probably f have forgotten by, by now. So externalization of the hierarchy by Alice Bailey. Uh, new age book, no doubt, but like I said, I'm open-minded. Probably I'll jump back into Margaret Barker after this book, but that's probably after my next surgery. Um, not sure when I'll post another video. Um, I'll, uh, I'll give that some thought. It'll probably be a surprise when I post the next video. Um, I won't be through this book, the externalization of the hierarchy. I won't be through this for some time. Um, but until then, uh, keep reading, keep an open mind, and pick up uh, the hidden tradition of the kingdom of God if you can find a cheap copy.